All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Current, the North Central Region Water Network's uh, Speed Networking Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Ann Nardi, and I'll be the facilitator for today's session. And today we're focusing on engaging the next generation of water stewards. Uh, before you, we get started, if you're not familiar with the North Central Region Water Network, we are a 12 state extension led collaboration working to ensure safe and sufficient water supplies across the North Central region of the United States. Uh, we host these on a monthly uh, basis. We also have a number of water related teams that host webinars and other virtual programming, uh, working to increase connectivity across the region among folks who work within water, as well as uh, increased learning and, and education. So we're excited for you to join us today. We have three great speakers lined up, uh, we're going to be talking about youth water education and educating the next generation of water professionals, uh, both in terms of, you know, K through 12, as well as uh, undergraduate and young professionals. And um, very excited to be talking about uh, different programs, as well as some research into the current state of water and environmental education. Before we get started, a couple housekeeping items for you. So we do have a Q&A session today. Um, we will have uh, three presentations and then we will do our Q&A at the end of all three presentations. So please put your questions for our speakers in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also upvote other questions that folks have had. So if you uh, see a question that you think is really pertinent, you might have the same one, uh, be sure to upvote that. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end, and we'll certainly take questions that are most popular first. Uh, if you are experiencing any technical issues, um, or if you wanted to, you know, um, speak with their uh, comment on the presentation or comment on some of how your work uh, relates to the presentation, feel free to do that in the chat panel. Um, we can also post relevant links in that. So we have that chat kind of for discussion about the webinar as well as about the North Central Region Water Network and the Q&A uh, panel really for the questions for the presenters. If you're having any audio issues, there is a phone in option that can be accessed by clicking the up arrow um, on the mute icon and then clicking switch to phone. So that can also be an option for you. A note that this presentation is being recorded. We will post the recording as well as the presentation slides on our website, northcentralwater.org. So you can find that um, if you click on uh, our media archive, you can find a recording of all our past webinars uh, dating back to 2014 when we started this series. All right, so jumping in to today's presentations, we have three great speakers for you today. Uh, John McMain, John's a member of our leadership team at uh, the North Central Region Water Network and is gonna be talking about a project that we are partnering on. It's a uh, REEU project um, and talking about providing undergraduate opportunities to undergraduate internship opportunities around water stewardship on a multi-state scale. Uh, Jennifer Fetter from Penn State Extension uh, is going to be talking about some of her youth programming work out in Pennsylvania and some of the programs she's doing uh, targeted to uh, K through 12 audiences. And then Justin Huffam from the University of Wisconsin Madison Division of Extension is going to be talking about some of his research into environmental educators and who we are reaching with environmental education as well as some uh, needs that environmental educators have in terms of professional development and training and how to effectively reach and engage diverse audiences. So uh, with that, we can start with our first speaker. Thanks so much for joining us, John. Uh, we know we have a lot going on on your plate right now, but uh, John is the you know, main PI for this, the project where we're engaging undergraduates. Um, it's been a pleasure to work on it, so I'm excited that he can talk a little bit about that project in more detail. I'm not going to read his full bio here, um, but I'll just uh, stop sharing and give you a chance to share your screen, John. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, and it is, you know, often we say it's a pleasure to, to get to be on these types of webinars and these opportunities, but I would say it truly is a, a pleasure um, because... It's something I'm very passionate about, and uh, so it's it's great to get the opportunity to talk about it. 
Um, just want to check, make sure the screen's coming through like it should be, Ann. Yeah, it looks great. Great. Okay. So, um, as Ann said, I, my name is John McMain. I'm at South Dakota State University, uh, Extension and Research Faculty here, and also took on some other responsibilities recently. Um, but main thing I'm going to talk about today is our, as Ann mentioned, REEU, which stands for Research and Extension Experience for Undergraduates. We kicked that off this summer, 2022. Uh, I'll get more into that. But um, today is Imagine a Day Without Water. Uh, for those of you that may not know, and I want you, if you can, uh, to imagine a day without water extension and research professionals. Um, for many of us, these are our colleagues. It's, it's, it's ourselves, right? It's what we do. It's what we care about. It's what we're passionate about. Um, and so it's hard for us to imagine a day without water extension and research professionals. But we can only imagine the impact that that would have if, if we were not doing the work that we're doing. Uh, so much great work across the region and across the country and across the world. But if you're an undergraduate, think of how, you know, if you're an undergraduate, it's not that hard to do because honestly, you're not really exposed much to uh, extension, uh, specifically extension in, in watershed management. Uh, there's not as many opportunities, I feel like, I, I don't know if there's studies in the literature that point to this, but um, there's not necessarily opportunities for an undergraduate student uh, to interact or to experience the extension side of things. And so we're all familiar with the land grant mission, but it was found, I mean, the first leg of the stool was education, right? Um, and then, of course, uh, expanded from a, a race perspective with the 1890 the second Moral Act, and then built in research to that and with the Hatch Act. And then finally, in 1914, you know, it was like, well, maybe we should get this information out to the communities that could use it to end users. Uh, then, of course, in 1994, um, bringing in uh, tribal colleges and universities into land grant status. But that third leg of the stool, if you will, the extension piece, um, it's, again, uh, there, there are some opportunities for students to interact with that through 4-H, um, a huge presence throughout the country. But in general, there's really a, a lack of awareness. Um, so, of course, a lack of interest in a, a career in that way. And so um, just to think a little bit more about what opportunities there are for research, of course, we, we know as an undergraduate, you can work in the lab, work for a PI, um, do undergraduate research. NSF is investing millions of dollars, um, $84 million in fiscal year 23 for research experience for undergraduate. Um, and of course, graduate students, you know, that requires research. So students have the ability to get to know about the teaching side, get to know about the research side, but what about the extension side? And so in 2015, um, USDA did launch an REEU, Research and Extension Experience for Undergraduates. Um, and of course, a graduate student, if their advisor has an extension appointment, then that's also an opportunity. But what about formalized teaching of, of methods, um, training, evaluation, all the things that really go into an, a successful extension program? Where's, you know, it, what is the opportunity for students to engage with that? And to be honest, and I don't mean to diminish the, the impact of, um, you know, research projects, but to be honest, extension and outreach is often an afterthought for a broader impact section, right? We, we work on a grant proposal and really the research idea often comes first get to the end of that and it's like well what can we do for broader impacts and well let's let's do some field days or let's set up a booth at a field day or, or whatever and so um, it's having professionals that are able to think about extension from the beginning I think is very important and so I, I think exposure to the extension side is very important um, especially at the undergraduate level um, because Really, once people are into their career path, it's it's there are fewer opportunities to add that kind of structured professional development. And so, what we did, uh, we we proposed, and I don't want to say we're unique um, in every sense of the word, but I think there are some unique characteristics of this 
And so we took advantage of the USDA uh, NIFA REEU um, funding opportunity. We're able to, we're successful in getting a, an REEU funded. And so really we wanted to leverage the regional extension experience and expertise. So in many states, you know, we're maybe one deep in our, our area of expertise. Um, but if you work across a region, you're able to get more perspectives, uh, more kind of diversity of backgrounds from a technical standpoint, not always from a, a social socioeconomic uh, standpoint. Um, and so we're fortunate to have a great team of 10 mentors across seven states, which covers around eight disciplines um, or very areas of expertise. The other thing we thought it was important to have this kind of regional model is because challenges, there's a lot of, you know, common threads, water quality, nitrate, bacteria, um, but there's a lot of things that are different. And so it's important to get perspectives from across the region of how to, of both problems and solutions. And so, um, but how do you bring together a group from across seven different states? And so what we proposed initially, this was actually pre-COVID that we initially proposed it, uh, was a virtual cohort. So having a cohort of students that we were able to do team building and, and really um, building that camaraderie of a cohort, but doing it virtually. And so in 2022, uh, there were nine students in six states. Um, and so I'm going to walk through just kind of what the, some of the experience was. Again, we wanted that exposure to regional challenges. Uh, we also wanted them to go away with a network, right? So when you think about what a student needs when they're going from maybe undergrad or a master's or even a PhD into an extension watershed management type role. One is you need an awareness of the problems, you need an awareness of the solutions. You need the skills to be able to implement those solutions. And another really helpful thing is having a ready-made network. And so with this virtual or kind of regional cohort, we have nine students, so future water professionals, and 10 mentors, and so current water professionals. And so that gives them an opportunity as they progress through their undergraduate career, as well as once they're into their professional careers, now they have an opportunity of both mentors and colleagues that they can reach, reach out to, or I should say mentors and contemporaries, because um, we're all colleagues, right? And then the other thing is we really emphasized um, was training and extension and applied research skills, which we wanted to lead to a portfolio of extension products. Um, we wanted, you know, on their resumes at the end of this, uh, this experience, there needs to be bullet points of, yes, you know, developed a fact sheet on nutrient reduction in Eastern South Dakota or whatever the case would be. But we wanted real tangible outcomes um, that they could point to. And then a big part of any type of outreach is interaction with stakeholders. And so we tried to get them in front of groups and interacting with groups from, from different backgrounds and specifically from backgrounds that were different than theirs. And so hopefully this led to an increased understanding and interest in career opportunities. And so some of the requirements um, or the kind of the structure of the, the summer, they had a weekly what we called Skillshare meeting. And so this was the mentors or people from outside the team that would spend an hour discussing various um, skills that would be helpful for extension professionals. So this could be how to talk about uh, challenging topics like climate change with audiences that may not be receptive to that. It could be how to uh, design a, you know, an extension program and integrate different types of media, whether it's fact sheets and, and uh, social media and videos and other stuff, or it could be you know, just more general science communication things to consider there. They also had a weekly cohort meeting where they worked on a regional challenge. And this was at the beginning, they identified a regional challenge and then kind of spent the summer working through some different products for that. And then they were also required within their state to develop three state specific products. Again, this could range from a video to a, a booth at a field day to an activity for a training. Uh, we left that pretty open. And then 
um, towards the end of the summer, they attended a peer learning summit where it was more, um, more learning, more professional development, and then presented a poster at a conference. So again, had an awesome team of mentors um, from across the region. And I'm going to just go really quick through the different, if you look, go back to the recording, you can pause this and, and look at each individual project, but just to kind of give you a scope of the range. Um, so Lena was an SDSU and she was looking at soil health and water dynamics. Um, Piper Siblick at UIUC in Illinois, looking at rain gardens and kind of interfacing between the public and, um, and that technology or that suite of practices and low impact development. Zach Janish, uh, again, looking at kind of soil health and how that interacts with water dynamics. Um, Boston Bartholomew ended up with both the kind of irrigation and riparian grazing, so a nice diversity of experience there. Miranda Hinches looking at uh, nitrate and tile drainage and how soil health, soil type um, affects that. Julian Cannibal Rodriguez looking at uh, private wells in Iowa. Uh, Amelia Brandenberger looking at um, wood chip analysis of uh, bioreactors in South Dakota. And Izzy Noctegal looking at carbon and it's carbon sequestration in soil. So really a, a nice breadth of of uh, topic areas. And again, that's possible because of this regional approach and the, the diversity of experts we had on the team. Um, at the Peer Learning Summit, they were able to spend a day together. They had some kind of team building uh, tours and things like that. And then we spent an afternoon with more professional development interaction between the mentors and the students, helping them think about careers and what type of preparation they needed for careers. And then they also presented a poster at the Climate Intersections uh, Conference in Duluth, Minnesota. So how did we do? What was the results of, uh, of the summer? And you know, I think quantitative results are very helpful and very useful, but at the end of the day, a story sometimes tells it best. So this is Miranda Hinches. I had the privilege of working with Miranda this summer and it kind of has continued through the school year. Well, this is a poster that she presented at an internship event um, after the summer was over. And I want to just zoom in here to the, the last section um, of her poster. What is your dream job? And as this, you know, this was an internship event. And so this was the, the type of questions that were supposed to be asked and answered on the poster. Um, but if you look at that, I would love to be able to speak with farmers in the community to raise awareness of water quality challenges and what they can do to help. A career in extension seems very likely for me after this internship. That to me, I mean, when I read that, it, it, it warmed my heart. I mean, it was such an exciting thing to read, but um, I feel very passionate that we need these types of opportunities. Uh, we need to expose undergraduate students in particular to uh, potential careers and extension and training that helps them. So over the five years, uh, we hope to have, you know, 45 Mirandas, right? People, undergraduate students that are, have the experience now, have the interest, have this, this regional network, understanding of regional challenges and really are our future water leaders. Um, so quick pitch here, how can you get involved? Um, we're actively recruiting now for the next cohort and that, you can uh, go on the North Central Region Water Network website under the, and you can um, get the QR code there if you want. Um, feel free to follow me on Twitter. I'll be tweeting about different opportunities related to the application process. And the application closes early December. So please feel free to share if there are any, um, anyone you think might be interested or reach out to us if there's any questions. So I'll stop for now. I'm over time. Sorry about that, Ann, but uh, hand it back to you. Not a problem. Thank you so much, John. Um, all right, perfect. Well, I'm gonna transition to our next uh, speaker, which is Jennifer Fetter. Um, who's joining us from Penn State Extension. You can read her full bio here. But Jen has really been leading youth water education efforts within the state of Pennsylvania. And I think there's a lot to learn from Extension professionals 
and environmental educators working across states. So very excited to hear about some of her programming. Thanks for joining us today, Jennifer. Great, thanks, Anne. I am uh, really excited to be able to share a little bit about what's going on here in Pennsylvania with everybody in the North Central region who's participating today. And um, honestly, it's kind of funny to me. Um, I seem to be a surrogate member of the North Central family this year. I uh, just finished traveling about the Eastern portion and Midwest of the United States with the this year's NELD cohort in the North Central region, um, which is not something that uh, Pennsylvania usually participates in because we're not really part of the North Central region, but um, we're really grateful for that opportunity as well. So um, so thanks for having me again in the North Central region to, to talk about uh, Pennsylvania issues and how you might connect them back to the North Central region. Um, John was talking about sort of engaging the next generation of water stewards uh, now as they're heading into their career paths as undergraduates. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, getting the next generation to you so that you can continue to do that in the future um, and sort of engaging our K through 12 audiences uh, to become water stewards um, by using our, our existing water stewards to help foster those young children into thinking about becoming water stewards in the future. Uh, I, I don't take credit for all of the things that I'm going to share with you. I have a great team within Extension and then a lot of partners outside of Extension in Pennsylvania helping with this effort. Um, but since this isn't your region, I'll just give you a little stage setting about Pennsylvania and, and why this is a critical issue for us. Um, we are a Great Lakes state, but we have very little drainage to the Great Lakes uh, watersheds uh, here in Pennsylvania. The, the bulk of our watersheds drain to um, three major basins. We have Ohio River Basin, which of course comes into your region and you know all about that. Uh, we have the uh, Susquehanna River Basin, which is the Chesapeake Bay watershed and um, really our most critical issue here in Pennsylvania. More than half the state drains there and, and we're the number one tributary to the Chesapeake Bay, which has serious impairment I'll talk about in just a moment. The very eastern portion of our state drains to Delaware Bay, which is kind of the Philadelphia area. So um, we have 86,000 stream miles, uh, really, really dense stream mile per per square mile of, of land, um, which is uh, sort of indicative of, of our problem, which is that about a third of our streams are listed as impaired in one way or another. Uh, we have a lot of land use, a lot of population here, a lot of stormwater issues, but we're also a major agricultural state. So there's just a lot going on on the land impacting our waterways. Uh, we also have a lot of people dependent on private wells. We have over a million private wells in the state. And those of you who work in that arena know there's really only about 14 million private wells in the entire country. So we got a big chunk of them here in Pennsylvania. And yet we stand as, as one of only two states left in the entire nation that doesn't regulate in any way the construction or testing of private water supplies. Uh, so lots of vulnerable groundwater issues as well. And then um, we run a municipal government system that is complicated. And so uh, we have over 1,059 permitted MS4 communities in Pennsylvania, which is, is madness and really hard to manage as well. Um, and then the sticky wicket I mentioned before is the Chesapeake Bay, uh, where half of our state is draining to the Chesapeake Bay, um, which is the nation's largest freshwater estuary and is significantly impaired as well. And here you can see giant mud blooms coming out of Pennsylvania and into the Chesapeake Bay, but um, even a little bit into the Delaware Bay in this image as well. Um, after a major storm event, the um, 1983 Chesapeake Bay program formation is sort of indicative of all the things that we've been trying to accomplish here in the state for a long time. But we just weren't doing a great job of, of meeting those goals. Uh, in 2010, the Obama administration passed an executive order to sort of reinvigorate the need for cleaning the Chesapeake Bay. In 2014, all of the governors of the states that uh, drained to Chesapeake Bay signed a new Chesapeake Bay agreement. And in that agreement, we have um, 10 goals and, and 31 outcomes that we're supposed to be achieving by 2025. Uh, spoiler alert, I don't think that's going to happen, but um, but we're still trying. Uh, among that 
set of 10 goals and, and 31 outcomes is environmental literacy. And so in addition to wanting to have an environmentally literate uh, K through 12 population and future water stewards, we also have to, in order to meet um, the complete package of goals in that Bay Agreement. Um, and just a little more complication added to the madness. Uh, we don't have county-based school systems. I know some of the states in our central region are similar in nature. We have over 500 public school districts in Pennsylvania, over 3,000 non-public schools, uh, just divided among 67 counties and 2,560 municipal governments. And in our last count, we only have about 500 people who self-identify as EE providers here in the state, which is still a significant number of folks, but um, but it's just not enough to adequately meet the needs of all these separate entities and, and units that we're trying to educate and create environmental literacy at. So, so much of the work we've been doing has been in capacity building and trying to better prepare the state to um, to achieve these environmental literacy goals. Uh, this is the last report from, from the Chesapeake Bay program. Uh, we do attempt to evaluate the entire state of Pennsylvania and not just the portion of the state that's in the Bay program jurisdiction. Um, that That is something that most of the secretaries of our various agencies in Pennsylvania have adopted because there's a lot of money and resources for the Bay and, and they wanna make sure that that's equitably distributed to the rest of the state as well. So attempting to, to touch base with at least our 500 public local education agencies here in Pennsylvania and find out how well prepared they feel they are to achieve environmental literacy. And um, the first thing you'll notice here in Pennsylvania is that we can't even get our, our local education agencies to apply to, or to reply to that inquiry. So the most, most of our schools are, are just not engaged in environmental literacy and and don't see the survey as a high priority for for responding we're not unique west virginia has a similar problem although they only have 55 local education agencies to to try to reach compared to our 499 we are unique in the bay states uh, and among the ones who do respond we have very few that say they're well prepared um, so we have a, a lot to achieve here in pennsylvania uh, one of the things that is part of that Chesapeake Bay agreement that we need to achieve as well and that we're trying to ramp up capacity for um, is, is getting our schools engaged in meaningful watershed education experiences, which is um, the MWEE here in Pennsylvania, affectionately referred to as the MIWI uh, model developed by NOAA, um, and adopted by the Bay program as sort of the gold standard for achieving environmental literacy. The expectation is that K through 12 students are gonna get uh, fourth uh, elementary, middle and high school level uh, connection to, to these meaningful watershed ex experiences because um, they through research have been identified to uh, be likely to increase environmentally responsible behaviors. Uh, and of course, help us to protect our waterways in the future and and maintain the restoration efforts we're putting together now. Um, but those who are implementing MIWIs here in Pennsylvania are uh, still not reaching their full potential. So A, we need to just make people aware that this framework for delivering education exists and B, actually get them to implement it in, it, in its complete capacity. I'll I'll walk you through some of the basics of that in just a minute here based on what we're doing. Um, but what I wanted to share and, and what got Anne contacted me in the first place was this future master watershed stewards program that we have with Penn State Extension here. Uh, we have a master watershed stewards program, not future, um, that is about a decade old now in Pennsylvania and among the 67 counties in the state, we have Mass Watershed Steward programs in now 42 of those counties. In the past 10 years, we've been able to achieve that, uh, about 900 trained volunteers. It's very similar to Master Naturalist or Master Gardener program in implementation. Our volunteers apply, interview, and then get selected and go through intense training 
in their first year and have a uh, significant volunteer commitment back to the program in their first year and then continuing education and volunteer commitments to maintain their title in future years. Um, we focus specifically on education and volunteer activities and issues that are related to watershed uh, restoration, watershed protection, waterways, and water quality, although, as you all know, that's that kind of covers the gamut of environment and natural resources education. Um, but our future Master Watershed Steward program is newer. Uh, it has been in pilot for the last few years. We actually started the pilot just before 2020, and so that sort of derailed us for a little bit, and then we were able to pick it back up again. Uh, but the idea is in increasing capacity for environmental literacy education is to sort of leverage our existing um, volunteer network, right? Instead of counting on the 500 professional environmental education uh, specialists and, and other informal educators across the state um, to go even further and, and tap into this 900 volunteer strong network of Master Watershed Stewards and find folks who are willing to go through additional advanced training on working with youth and then partnering with school classrooms and other existing youth programs to, to extend their knowledge and want to participate in uh, civic action and stewardship across the state. So basically implementing that meaningful watershed education experience. Uh, we're no fan of reinventing the wheel. So we're mostly applying existing tools and resources and just packaging them in a way that helps us leverage the, the human resources, the people resources. So we're using a tested watershed education curricula that already exists here in Pennsylvania. It's one that uh, was created almost 20 years ago now and has been through a lot of updates and, and uh, rigorous testing through our state Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Uh, it's implemented by their state parks program. Um, so their environmental education specialists are all trained in this, can offer training for our volunteers, help get them trained to utilize their curriculum. Um, then we use, of course, this tested MIWI framework that NOAA developed um, and our tested volunteer engagement program, which is our Master Watershed Stewards program. So it's a really great pairing of these existing tools and resources. So I'll just tell you what the basics are, what, what's involved in the future Master Watershed Steward Program is about um, 40 hours of in-depth watershed related training and 50 hours of volunteer service commitment, and then 20 hours of ongoing continuing education by our volunteers before they even get involved in the future Master Watershed Steward Program. So they're extensively trained and, and engaged. Um, the MIWI framework basically has uh, youth experiencing environmental education through exploring a defined issue. Um, so a lot like John was talking about, understanding the regional issues that are going on uh, in, in water quality in your area, we're looking to students to be able to uh, identify an issue that's going on where they live in their place, um, be able to define it and ask meaningful questions about that issue uh, to help them um, do some kind of field exploration, get outdoors, uh, collect data, and then bring it back to the classroom and go through the process of synthesizing the data and drawing some conclusions. Uh, that, that could be as straightforward as stream studies, like you see the kids in the picture here doing, um, or it could be something much more advanced and complicated that really d digs into a regional issue going on uh, or a local issue in their school district or, or community. Um, and then they're driven to do some kind of an environmental action project um, that is, is developed and generated through their own student voice. So not the teacher says, okay, today we're going to go out and do a litter cleanup, but that through the data they've collected, the conclusions they've drawn, that they're identifying what that environmental action project ought to be. Of course, we know there's limitations to what can be accomplished in the classroom, um, but the MIWI framework does sort of allow for that and the trainings that we offer to, to teach how to use this framework, um, help teachers and our volunteers to sort of guide students to a practical environmental action project that meets their goals, but is also within the limits of their abilities. And then uh, the watershed education curriculum I mentioned that we're utilizing is a, a pretty thick curriculum for sixth through 12th grade that uh, addresses hands-on field investigations, has uh, interdisciplinary lessons that uh, take them into their 
uh, classrooms outside of the science arena uh, onto math and um, language arts and uh, culture and history and uh, social sciences. So there's a lot of lessons in there that they can utilize throughout their school curriculum. Um, but it does involve a, a pretty rigorous stream monitoring education experience where they get out and look at physical, chemical, and biological components of the stream, stuff that a lot of us are, are familiar with, but it's nice to have a curriculum in hand. And then they actually um, have a, a journaling and a watershed education portfolio component, which gives teachers uh, a significant rubric tool that they can use then to to grade and assess their students' participation. And, and of course, all teachers find that to be sort of critical to, to adopting a education curriculum in the classroom. Um, so, you know, we've had the opportunity to pilot this uh, the last few years. And the plan is, is really to launch this out this spring more broadly as we start to uh, ramp up training of our Master Watershed Steward volunteers. Um, but we have seen um, knowledge increase across all of our classes that have participated and and the ability to get to that point where they are adopting uh, stewardship and civic action projects. One of the things we really haven't been able to do, but the MIWI framework has done the homework for us is, is kind of check back and see um, how participation in, in that framework and the student-driven civic action projects lead them to future water steward behaviors, whether that's actually moving forward in a career in, in water stewardship or just making good choices, uh, both uh, in their daily lives, in their communities, at the polls, um, when it comes to water stewardship. Um, and then because shameless plugs are, are important and, and John told you how you could get involved in his work, I'll tell you how you can get involved in some of our work as well. Um, in addition to launching up this future Master Watershed Steward Program, we do take water education for youth very seriously in Pennsylvania. Um, we've been doing so for the last 15 years or so, really elevating it to the forefront of uh, work going on at Penn State Extension. So we hold a, a biennial Dive Deeper Summit. It's a gathering of anyone who teaches youth about water in any capacity for professional development day. It's uh, networking, it's looking at innovative new teaching tools, curricular resources, sharing best practices, getting up to date on new critical issues going on in Pennsylvania and the Mid-Atlantic's waterways. Um, we do call it a regional multi-state conference. Um, during COVID, we went virtual and it became an international conference. We actually brought in multiple people from outside the United States and a lot of folks from across the country. And with that said, we encourage you to think about coming to Pennsylvania uh, next fall. Um, I'll show you the dates and save the dates here in just a moment. But um, just you can see growing over time um, as we've been implementing this particular conference, we've really uh, increased in magnitude uh, how many people are attending, getting engaged, wanting to know more about how to include water education in their youth activities, um, and just how motivated folks are to, to take what they've learned and implement them with youth when they leave the conference, um, how much they're learning, how much their confidence and knowledge on how to and why to teach youth about water is increasing, and then how much they're actually utilizing materials um, after the conference, um, not just with youth, but taking some of those lessons and using them with adults as well. So we don't have any kind of registration materials available right now, but we are holding our next Dive Deeper Summit September 28th. It'll be in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, jot that down and then just search for Dive Deeper Summit. Uh, you can actually look on our website now. You'll see the, the base page exists, but there's nothing you can do there right now. Registration won't open until next year sometime. Um, and, and, uh, we are hosting the national conference of ANREP in 2024 in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Um, so if not saving one date, save the other, or save both, but May 6th through 8th, 2024, um, we'll be hosting the Association of Natural Resources Extension Professionals here. Great opportunity and forum for talking about water resources, extension education, um, and probably having a focus on how we're implementing these programs with youth as well, since that is a big priority for us in Pennsylvania. I imagine that will be a track at the conference as well. So all the shameless plugs you can imagine in one presentation. And with that, I will stop.
Great, thank you so much, Jen. All right, for our third present presenter, I'm really excited to have Justin Huffam here joining us. Justin is an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and also an affiliate at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Justin's a part of the project that John was talking about earlier, um, but right now he's gonna be talking about him, some of his research into environmental educators and the audience they're reaching and some of their professional development needs. So thanks so much for joining us, Justin. You bet. Thanks for having me. I'm going to dial up my slideshow here and get rolling. Um, all right. What do you see there, Ann? Looks great. The right stuff. All right. Great. Well, thanks, Ann. And um, yeah, as, Ann, as mentioned, um, I'm a, a part of the project John is leading um, and, and actively recruiting right now for uh, our summer intern. So um, uh, one of those host sites will be in Wisconsin with uh, do, doing work like what I'll describe here in a second. Um, and and then to echo what uh, Jennifer was saying, there, there's just so many commonalities and shared um, shared needs and shared kind of situations that you know are, we find across the, the region and across the country about looking at environmental science education. And um, just to, you know, briefly, you know, take a step to the side here for doing a bit of discourse analysis on engaging the next generation of water stewards, you know, you know, unpacking that a little bit, or unpacking the title of our grant, which is, uh, you know, filling the pipeline. You know, I think it's important for us, if, if we're going to do those things, um, to, to really, at least, you know, at the outset of the grant, if not throughout and at the end, um ask who who you know for whom for for who who are we doing this and with whom and and what's our do, do we want the next generation to look just like the last generation is is that a different group of people um it, of course it's kind of a rhetorical question of course it's different um our, our cities are changing our industries are changing our states are changing and the next generation of water stewards uh don't look like the last generation of water stewards you know they'll they will um reflect the, ch the changing demography of our our country and our states and our counties and our cities so uh, with that in mind i think it's really important to 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 think about that as a strategy both with young people in in youth development um and then of course with you know, the progression on to college and university and then working with professionals in the field um, this is really needed at every one of those stages to to um, do you know culturally appropriate um, and you know culturally relevant um, watershed education. Um, so I got two parts of my uh, little talk here, and one is about the status and needs report, um, which will sound a lot like what um, Jennifer was saying, some of these details, and then um, I'll, I'll throw some resources at the end of my slides here. If you're interested in learning more about expanding um, the thought process on 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 this idea, so um, over the last uh, nine years, we've run a status and needs report in Wisconsin for environmental education orgs. And um, when we first did that, um, you know, we identified over 790 environmental education organizations, and um, we we now do a, a sub subset survey of 100 orgs organizations in the state that do environmental education as their day to day business, and we look at a lot of different um, things that they do um, in terms of supporting staff or diversity, equity, inclusion, many other um, many other kind of facets of the work, and so um, this uh, round you know just to kind of situate that a little further. You know, we estimate by by the survey participation, you know, that this field is around three three thousand folks uh, in the state and uh, over a million days of outreach. Um, that's self-reported from the survey respondents, so undoubtedly it's larger than that. But this is the data we have, and um, again, self-reported, it's this is around a forty million dollar a year industry in terms of what it does, and um, it's important to quantify. Uh, that when we speak with uh, stakeholders or um, policymakers or or you know funders too, you know like what okay you do environmental science education you know wh what's that look like who's that for how is that is that like what happens at 
my nature center or at the zoo or and so you we you know, we want to describe that as best we can and and then we can describe what we want to do and how we want to move move forward and progress so um you know partnering is really a big thing in this industry not just in wisconsin but of course around the around the country um so taking a um a little bit more specific look at the topic of diversity equity and inclusion um you know it's clear most um most organizations have um, put a priority on this and um, however within that there's a spectrum of you know there is a priority but there's a spectrum of whether that strategy is articulated uh, implemented or um, or just kind of a aspiration and um, that um, this is more or less a thumbnail sketch of that breakdown so about about half of you know folks you know have no strategies in place for some of these ideas Though, though they are value, valued or espoused values in those orgs. So that's an area of opportunity, area of work. And then there's about 20%, and this is kind of consistent, you know, we see about 20% that self-report fully implemented strategies in place. Um, when we look around, and you know, the study looks at Wisconsin specifically, but you could really, you could really run this anywhere. Um, I'm not saying the data, the results would be the same anywhere, but um, I think these questions are pretty universal in terms of, um, you know, what what's it look like when we're doing this on the ground with environmental ed and, and who's doing it and who's who who's a kind of a recipient or the learner in that process. And this is a, just a thumbnail here about the um, kind of student diversity um, and and then the instructor diversity around our state. And so you can see there's a pretty wide gap between who's who's doing the teaching and who's in the class and um and we know for lots of reasons you know that that's a gap that we need to be conscious about um describing and and addressing um in particular with an aspiration to um engage the next generation of water stewards it's going to be important that, that there's more parity in these um these graphs um so a couple of specific, you know, details here, um, you know, do you have, you know, if you're going to accomplish this next generation aspiration, you know, you, we're going to need lesson plans in different languages other than English. Um, we're going to need uh, cultural representation in those lessons that uh, engage as an activity um, or a dialogue that is, um, you know, not from the normative standpoint or the colonial normative. Um, and um, and then we you know are going to need to articulate specific strategies uh, to uh, uh, beyond just saying hey we we welcome anyone that comes you know that's not really a strategy to 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 take action that's just um, that's a passive um, commitment and so that that's what this um, piece at the bottom here um, fifty nine percent have strategies in place which is that's pretty good um, here's what folks are asking for um, you know uh, about half uh, it's about split 50-50, we haven't seen this number change in the last five years, really. It's about 50-50, does the organization provide training on DEI? So I would expect that is going to change in, in a positive way soon. Um, and then here's some quotations, you know, of what folks are looking for. You know, we need training for both the staff and the board of directors. Um, and we need to hear stories about what, what it looks like when it's successful. We see these themes come through. Um, consistently over the years so those are some things to think about because not just training staff it's who's the decision maker in your organization it might be a board of directors it might be institute director it might be some other type of hierarchy but um for the organization to embody that change that training has to be at each all the levels that decisions are made and so um there's a citation for this and this is funded through a um uh uh, Mellon Foundation grant, Just Futures Initiative, and that, that looks at anti-racism uh, work in in the sciences. Uh, a couple of you know takeaways, if you want them. Um, I recently edited, I guest edited this um, uh, publication um, about environmental literacy education, and uh, in this, uh, there's a link at the end of my slides. You can download these for free. Um, there's a few. Um, great articles in here about how to think about doing this as a community engaged mindset. So you want, you're thinking about, your, you know, being an instructor with a content area and a community, you know, there's three kind of big components there. So the, the cover here is from native land 
digital, which I, again, if you haven't seen this, this is pretty great um, way to interact with and start a conversation about with yourself or your staff team or whom with whom you're you're working or teaching. You know, it's a just to um, back out a second with our assumptions or the assumptions that might be in our curriculum and, and, and really consider um, the land and the many generations of um, uh, land occupation that have happened over the years. And I think that's, that's a really, it's one of many ways to, to have an entry point into the, the conversation towards racial equity. Um, and a couple highlighted um, articles here. This, this is the, uh, my favorite out of the edition here. And, um, um, and, and this one here has some some good strategies for implementation. Uh, and of course, here's a an easy grab and go um, uh, way to start talking about um, who, whose land um, we're on. So uh, that concludes um, my prepared remarks. And um, here's the link. I think Anne sends this out at the end of the show maybe or as a wrap up um, you get maybe get access to these slides but these links will take you to the material that um, i presented here today so thanks a lot thanks so much justin really appreciate it all right well it looks like we have a few uh not a ton of time for questions but we do have roughly 10 minutes here so um, I'm going to ask folks to please put their questions for our presenters into uh, the, the Q&A panel and we can um, start having a discussion. I appreciate you sharing a lot of those resources, Justin. I was aware of uh, the digital land site, but I was not aware of the land acknowledgement resource cards. Uh, that would have been helpful this summer, so I appreciate <laughs> let, letting us know about it. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I do have a question here for uh, Jennifer and myself. Jen, I'm curious to know a little bit more about, you know, within the pilot programs for the future master uh, water stewards, uh, caught myself, uh, that, you know, it is a lot of training. Are you seeing it mainly through, you know, classes and camps, or is it something that you could picture individual, you know, youth joining as well? <laughs> Excuse me. I just as I was about to talk, I start coughing. So, um, ideally, to kind of keep it within the context of of being that MeWe model, it does need to be somewhat systemic. That we're trying to see like whole cohorts of youth going through it together and having repeated contacts. But um, our hope is. Um, and in full disclosure, you know, a lot of the context for future master watershed stewards came from a previously existing program we had in Pennsylvania uh, called our 4-H Stream Teams program, which was very much the same model of following the MeWe, um, but implemented through our 4-H club program. Um, we really struggled to maintain those clubs as active clubs because we just don't have a strong environmental education program through Penn State's 4-H program. Um, so we just didn't have the volunteer capacity to keep that actively running across the whole state, which is why we're looking at the Master Watershed Steward program instead as, as sort of the home for the program. It's still very much a 4-H model program and our youth will still be recorded through the 4-H system. But um, so we do have the opportunity then for 4-H clubs to still participate for individual youth to maybe start up a group, but it is more of an interactive group process than it is an individual uh, experience. And so I don't see a lot of room for, for an individual future master watershed steward as much as, as engaging groups at one time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. Mallory does have a question in here. It looks like Mallory's from the Children's Water Fest. In your lifetime and career, what are top two messages of water stewardship that you found or, you know, what top one or two guiding principles for, for teaching youth? I think this is probably to all, all three of you. I mean, I know, John, the youth you've been working for are young adults, but I think it probably could still that, you know, general messages of stewardship or guiding principles could still be relevant. I'll just go quick. Um, I think the number one thing I'd say to people is it's everyone's responsibility. Um, often, it, if you're able to point a finger, you resolve yourself of any responsibility. And so that's 
a point I like to start with and then point to examples of, of positive things that different groups are doing. Uh, boy, the thing I say to almost every group of youth I've ever talked to about water stewardship and kind of their future is the same old adage, all the water we have on earth is all the water we're ever going to have on earth. It's, it's the same water over and over and over again. So we better take care of it. Yeah, I, I second the comments from the representative from Pennsylvania. The uh, it's uh, It's all you get. What you got's what you got. And that's so true across all natural resource education, really. I mean, to some degree, you know, the, the air we have, the water we have, the soil. I mean, when I've taught soils courses, it's the same thing. You know, we're not getting more of it on a timeline that you're going to appreciate. You know, it's, you know, 8,000 years or something to create some of these uh, changes in soil that we benefit from. And um, for all intents and purposes, I I don't intend to be around that long. So um, what we got, what you see is what you got, you know, the, um, the simplest answer is take care of it and, and understand, understand how it works. Yeah, kind of that there is no planet B, you know, uh, um, messaging there. Matt has a question here that I think is really um, pertinent. He says, any ideas on how to get more interaction with work study students to work with extension? Uh, and that's worked with us here in Wisconsin and can be key with tight budgets as we only pay 25% of the wage so we can offer good jobs. Any thoughts on that? I would say, and I don't need to be the only one to answer this first, sorry. Um, biggest thing is communicating. I mean, making sure that I guess people in, in places that can connect others are communicating about opportunities. Um, and so that's, that would be making sure that extension, you know, interfaces with students, right. And making sure department heads are kind of aware of the needs and, and are, are able to, to put the human resources that in that direction. Looks like uh, there's a comment or a question in the chat here from um, uh, Shabu um, from the University of Illinois. So Jennifer, what was the funding available to pilot the PA Master Watershed Stewards program when that started maybe a decade ago? I mean, I agree. I think that program sounds very interesting and not something that I've heard of we having in the North Central region. Was it more focused on youth and did you partner with school or for age or both? That so yeah, the, this I, question I, about funding is first for the future master watershed stewards program. Yeah, so funding for the pilot for the future master watershed stewards program, um, we were able to leverage a little bit of money through our state's environmental education fund. They set aside a percentage of money collected in fines uh, for environmental education grants. And so we were able to tap into some of that. Um, we're able to use a little bit of the money we actually have budgeted for our adult master watershed stewards program as well. Um, when we piloted as a 4-H stream teams program before it adjusted to master watershed stewards, future master watershed stewards program, we had money through the original USDA water program uh, to get that off the ground as well. Of course, that funding doesn't exist anymore, so it doesn't help Shabu at all, but um, but yeah, trying to, I mean, it does, it's not extensively expensive to implement, well, especially when you're leveraging partners, it's more covering the people costs, the salary costs and dedicating someone to it, which we all know is a real challenge because most funders don't want to pay for people. Right. Yeah, we've, we've certainly, we actually have a human capital blog series here at the North Central Region Water Network where we talk about the power of people and human capital. So certainly understand that and understand that challenge. I think we might have time for maybe one more question that I'm gonna to try to sneak in. Um, and this is from Melissa saying that in Kentucky, they're really trying to get the 4-H stream team program off the ground, but it's been a challenge to recruit Willing County programs. And wondering if you have any insight onto how you get that buy-in from the county partners for the future watershed stewards. Yeah, I mean, thinking about how our 4-H programs struggle, a lot of it is getting volunteer commitment and long-term active 
you know, enthusiasm on their part. So um, trying to buy into environmental programs and 4-H can be a challenge when, when most of your volunteers are dedicated to the idea of animal science and fair projects and things like that, but not necessarily the environmental science side. So I mean, that's really why we wanted to tap into our incredibly enthusiastic Master Watershed Steward Network to, to create those new volunteers. I suspect our 4-H programs will be thrilled when we bring active volunteers to them instead of asking them to help us find those volunteers to lead the program. Yeah, excellent point there, kind of with our, you know, volunteerism fatigue or like going to the same leaders over and over again, leader leadership fatigue, perhaps something that we've dealt with on extension before. Uh, all right, well, we are at the top of the hour. So I do wanna close this up. Thank you so much to each of our presenters for taking time. Uh, the J squad, just coined that right now, but you all have J's in your name. <laughs> so thank you so much. Their emails are up there um, in case you had a burning question that you weren't able to get answered or if you wanted to reach out to them about their specific program that they were referencing. Um, a little reminder as well that we do have, uh, we did record this session. This will be up on our website. You can go to northcentralwater.org for the recording of the website or the presentation slides as well um, to get that, as well as to find out about future webinars. We have our the current webinar next month, which is going to be focusing on precision conservation tools using GIS, so a totally different topic but could be something that's of interest. We also have an upcoming webinar at the end of the month from our climate team, the North Central Climate Collaborative on uh, soil health opportunities for climate mitigation and adaptation. So there's a link to that website as well. Thank you so much for joining us today and I hope you have a great rest of your day.